seems to dominate our cultural palette and our carbon footprint, it's sometimes important to think and work differently. Today, and stemming in part from Dance North's performance of Red Upstairs, some of you may have just caught the performance that's finished about five minutes ago, um, we'll launch into a conversation about the urgent concern driving the creation of that work, and more broadly, creating small theatre and performance works about big issues. To walk us through this conversation, we have Kyle Page, Artistic Director of Dance North, Sam Routledge, Artistic Director of Tasmania's national flagship theatre company, Terrapin Puppet Theatre. And we also have Davina Wright from New Tasmania's Theatre and Performance. So please join me in welcoming Kyle, Sam and Davina onto the stage. sort of see you today, which is really lovely. Um, I went and saw Red last night and this morning saw Heap kind of wandering through the markets and then Quarren and Drill in the in St Martin, St David's Park? St David's, thank you. Um, and there's a lot of big ideas in this festival and it's been so wonderful, you know, the light's changing and winter's coming. It's felt so wonderful to, to see them happening around us. I think the first thing I want to ask both of you, because you've both run um, companies in regional spaces, is how do you choose the scale of a work and, and what drives that decision what, the, to, to know what shape it holds? Um, hello. I feel as though, in many instances, the work kind of drives that decision irrespective of my own desire. And I collaborate always with Amber Haynes, my wife and the co-director of RED. And we really, we begin with ideas and we begin with a sense of curiosity. And then we begin with a group of humans and we work very, very collaboratively. Um, from the dancers, who our full-time ensemble who we work with every day, to an incredible, um, cohort of collaborators, creative collaborators, Hilary Coyne, our executive director, and an amazing team in the production department, and then the office running the administrative and management side of the company. And really, th these kind of, these seeds of ideas emerge, and then in many kind of strange and enigmatic ways, the, the scale of the project is just called for. So, you know, Red, Red was an idea born way before of COVID, way before isolation, way before this idea of the bubble. Um, and that project felt as though it was an, an intimate exploration of a really, really large idea. And the ideas didn't need to be explored within a really, really large context, but the, the idea itself is very big. So it feels as though the work calls for the scale, and then we do what we can with the budget that we've got to make that a possibility. Yeah. Um uh, I would uh, echo those comments in regards to listening to the idea, but also um, I think we um, really listen to our audience and uh, really try to understand, you know, where the where the need is, where is the need for our work, and uh, some ideas their scale emerges, and then. Others, we can look to where there might be a need for our work and the need, where the need is to go, will then determine the scale of the work. And, um, you know, Terrapin um, is, is really a product of the Tasmanian geography in a way. Like, what's great about Terrapin is what's great about Tasmania. It's a small state. There are small travel distances between... Um, the, the major centres and the regional centres. So, for instance, our school's touring work, that needs to be of quite a limited scale. It needs to set up in an hour and pack down in half an hour so that we can reach the most possible children in Tasmania. And we've just started doing some work in aged care. And again, that work needs to be of small scale so we can reach as many older Tasmanians <laughs> as we can. And um, 
I, I loved Red. It was so, it was such a great work. I really um, so much enjoyed it last night. Um, and I, you know, what I can see in it or, or what I really love about it is that when, when the sort of scale of a work reveals itself, or this is what I find with my process, is that as the brief narrows and you become clearer on what the brief is, the inventiveness of the artists and the company starts to shine because your choices narrow. And it doesn't mean you're any less creative. It's just you can sort of be more creative because everyone gets very focused on what the purpose is. So I, um, I really enjoy that, that process when, when the scale of a work and, you know, like you say, the pragmatism um, um, starts to bite. Um, people start to um, sort of sometimes do their best work. Yeah, wonderful. I, I, I think this leads from that in that I've heard you both talk about your audience in such a sort of focused and wonderful way. And I wonder if you can talk to that, Kyle. And we were having a conversation and you talked about the fact that an audience is... Um, Heartbeat synchronizers, and that for me, like I've just been thinking about that shared experience because sometimes it's hard. Um, but can you can you talk to that? Yeah. So there's a beautiful study done in the UK in the 90s, and what that study found was that an audience's heartbeat would begin to synchronize when watching live performance, and it's a really beautiful metaphor for the collective experience that we're you know we're sitting next to one another. In some instances, particularly with dance, it's a very subjective experience. It's non-narrative often. There's no language that you're following. And yet, still, there's this kind of energetic undercurrent of connectivity. And I just think that's such a beautiful, very, very powerful um, aspect of the human experience. And it's something that we don't get when we're at home watching Netflix or you know, even watching something even watching live performance on the screen, as many of us would have done during the last few years with lockdowns and whatnot. But this thing to sit with a group of humans and experience something together is incredibly powerful. And it's powerful in ways, not only in the kind of verbal, intellectual, cerebral space, but it's powerful in our bodies. It's powerful as a visceral experience. It's powerful as an energetic experience. And the heart really speaks to that reality. Yeah, I felt that last night, and towards towards the end of that piece, I felt my breath shorten. You know, I was there with them, and 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 felt like I wanted to do something for them. Yeah, you're not the first one. Yeah. <laughs> I just wanted to leap up with a pocket knife and slice them out. <laughs> Sam, I have a similar, it's so different, but it's a similar experience of your work and being at Dodgers Ferry in their primary school and watching Paper Escaper. And the children were standing up and screaming out and, and don't, don't hurt her, you know. Um, they were so invested in the work and I thought about, you know, Shakespeare and that we haven't always sat quietly together. It was still one, you know, they were experiencing it more like a football match, like a, a roar of response to things. How does that, because that's a hard audience too, you know, they're, sometimes they're, <laughs> they're actively um, engaging with the work. How does that um, sort of shape how you make work in that way? Yeah, I think, I mean, <clears throat> I think, you know, in the, in the school's context, the children are totally in their own environment. So children in their own school are very different to children in a theatre. They're in their own environment and they're, they're, all of their relationships at school exist there. It's very much their own space. They're in the majority. Their parents aren't there. There's a few teachers, but the children are in the majority. And many, um, many Tasma for many Tasmanian children, a Terrapin show will be their first experience of the performing arts. And over our last two shows, we've really um, lent into making non-verbal work. So making work that has no dialogue um, and is entirely told through music and pictures. And what's beautiful about that and what I really enjoy about that is that the, children, the children's voices have an active role to play in the work. 
and they will feel confident explaining to the child next to them what is happening, um, which is very funny because they will explain the obvious to their classmates, um, putting themselves in a position of sort of authority. Um, and so it, um, like I just think it's, you know, it's very important um, to be able to take those, to, to take those works into, into the schools. And um, it's so interesting what you were talking about, about the audience's heartbeat synchronising. Um, Terrapin's been in strategic planning recently and having a sort of great opportunity to talk to the board about what puppetry does. And um, Ronnie Burkett, who's a very famous Canadian marionettist, talked about a similar thing with the heartbeat, but with the breath with a puppet, that, um, and that everyone starts to breathe in the same, um, in the, uh, their, their breaths align um, through watching a puppet. But what happens with puppetry is, you know, I think puppeteers or pup puppeteers are like the work people of the theatre, like the labourers of the theatre, because they're holding objects. And what happens in puppetry um, is that everyone is looking at the same thing. So the puppet is there and the puppeteers are focused on the puppet and the audience are focused on the puppet and everyone is focused on this one thing, which is between the audience and the performer. And um, something really wonderful happens in that space, in the puppeteers being in service to the puppet, um, which is a very humble um, place to be. But um, yeah, you know, we're, we're very lucky to be working in the, in the art form that we're working in, the performing arts. Yeah, absolutely. And I, and I think the thing also that I thought about both of those experiences, um, the dance and then with the puppetry schools tour, is that I didn't walk away um, feeling devastated. And probably that's more surprising with the topic of red. Um, because we are tired, I think, and we've talked about this, uh, you've talked to the fact that people are desensitised, but I think also overwhelmed, you know. Um, there's so much information and news and, 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 and devastation. And what is the role of performance and, and dance in that? Because I think you did something really special last night. And I wonder for you, what is that? What is that role? How do we communicate that? How do we together kind of hold that space and not look away from it? Um, I think in part the role of the arts in engaging with really big conversations that can be entirely overwhelming is maybe firstly just to show up and to participate in a conversation and be a part of that dialogue and in sharing that exchange with an audience, perhaps kind of crack open a lens that is not as readily available when we're reading words on a screen or when we're kind of hearing people speak to us, um, you know, on a news story or something. And there's something really powerful about shifting the narrative through creative avenues of divergent thinking. It's like, ah, oh, okay, well, my brain maybe hadn't thought of that thing in that way or my body hadn't felt about that thing in that way. And we are desensitised. We're so saturated and bombarded by news and, of course, the stories that get picked up are the kind of really devastating, horrific things in the world. So we're often saturated with things that are really... Um, really upsetting or feel really... Like, we can leave us feeling quite helpless or hopeless. And I also just love the idea that these don't need to be enormous gestures that save the world. It's like sometimes it's the micro gesture. And I was watching with my son, Bear Grylls. He's obsessed with Bear Grylls. I love that he's obsessed with Bear Grylls. He hasn't become obsessed with video games yet, which I'm really embracing. Um, and Bear Grylls says, so you're walking along the beach and that one kind of bottle ring thing that you pick up, that may not feel like much, but if that thing is not picked up by you and then floats out into the ocean and gets caught around the neck of one turtle, then that's one life that you've saved by taking that moment to pick that thing up. So I feel as though sometimes the small gestures and the many, many, many small gestures 
are a far more powerful way to engage with the challenges and the trouble of the world than feeling as though we need to kind of carry the weight of all the things all the time. And if we can each take a small step in that direction, then collectively really powerful things can emerge. And I think a beautiful quote by Margaret Mead, never under underestimate the power of a few thoughtful humans to change the course of history. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. And maybe if we're all thoughtful individuals, then collectively very thoughtful things can emerge. Um, concur. Um, and um, I actually just want to talk about, I just want to talk about works of scale. Works of scale are really hard. It's really hard to do a really, really good work of scale. And um, to sort of throw a bomb into the situation in a way, um, the, the opportunities that are given to do works of scale in this country have largely fallen to text-based theatre companies because the way that the, 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 the arts have been structured when there was the major performing arts board organisations, there were major dance companies um, and, you know, the, the, the lion's share of the money goes to the big companies like the ballet and the opera. And then there were the state-based theatre companies. Um, and all of those state-based theatre companies largely championed the text as the central vehicle for theatre. Um, and, you know, they've had, you know, quite stable funding and, and quite a lot of funding. Um, and so um, with, with Terrapin, with Dance North being brought into the new performing arts framework, National Performing Arts Partnership Framework, um, I, I, I really, um, I hope that we will see more works of scale from companies like ours that work in a visual medium and don't work with text at all or, or not as much. Um, and so I, the reason I want to talk about this is just in your, you know, when you're talking about the small things, um, in, in, in where I've come from in my practice as an artist, um, the opportunities that I have had through my 20 year career working in puppetry have been for smaller works. And I've now gotten to a point where I'm pretty good at smaller works. Um, and I feel like I have a really good understanding of the basics. Um, and when Mona Foma gave Terrapin an opportunity to do a work of scale, which was um, Ubu, King Ubu, um, in the Gorge, which was um, in Launceston, which was performed for 7,000 people, um, you know, 2,000 people, around 2,000 people a night, um, I felt as an artist that I had acquired the basics of storytelling and making work that I was then able to undertake and make a work of scale. Um, and, I, you know, hopefully I'll have that opportunity again. Um, but may, I think, I, just in terms of size, it feels like through many opportunities to make works where the scale is limited, then you, I, I've gotten the confidence to be able to feel like I'm ready to do works of scale. And one other thing I just want to say is that in making small scale work, um, one of the things that I suppose the, the gift that's been given to me in being able to have opportunities to make small scale works and think in small scale works is touring and being able to take your work internationally and learn about your own practice through seeing it in another country or you know, representing your country in international arts festivals and works that are invented small and invented in a way to um, be um, efficient with their touring, which I imagine Red very much is, and I think that, you know, it's one of the great things about it, two performers, but also you've got an inflatable, and that inflatable packs down small, and yet we've got this work with an amazing construct of, you know, the ticking clock that has spectacle in it. You know, it is, it is a, a form of spectacle um, and it has such visual impact, but it's been designed inventively so that it packs down pretty small. So if you get uh, an invitation from an international festival, then you're going to have a pretty good shot at going because we're so far over the other side of the world. If it's in Europe, you're going to have a good shot of going because your freight and your flights are not large. So you can, you know... Thinking big and working small, um, there are many advantages in being able to have that inventive thinking around working small.
Yeah, absolutely. And and I think also seeing the, the follow-through, um, you know, I know with Bryony Anderson uh, at Terrapin, went to meet her the other day and I drove and I felt so guilty because she's really um, precise and careful about her imprint on the world. And, um, it you know, it does make you think too sort of about your impact and um, the, the chance for you to have an impact or, or not that you get lost in this, it's all structural, it's all so big, it's all kind of out of my control and let it go. And, and I've seen that in, in the way that Terrapin run their company as well. Um, the other thing I thought about last night was the power of liveness. And, and I know you've spoken about that with the audience, but post-COVID, it is hard for us sometimes to be in these spaces together. You know, especially I know my friends in Melbourne, but here too, you know. Um, it's hard to come back into that space, but it's so powerful. How have you found post-COVID coming back into these, these spaces? So we were really very fortunate in many ways to be based up in Townsville, so we didn't experience anywhere near the length or intensity of lockdowns that many cities did, particularly Melbourne um, and all our dear friends and family who had two or three years of really, really challenging times there. So it feels as though it's been a kind of fairly seamless transition for us as an organisation, but of course the you know, the, the disruptions along the way and the continued conversations and the caution that uh, audiences are obviously um, experiencing or um, bringing to the theatre with them. Also the caution for presenters and festivals and venues. And because, and speaking of international touring, for sure there's interest and in it's starting to open up, but because the audiences aren't showing up in the way that they were pre-2020, um, the conversations are slow. They're slowly unfolding, but presenters are a little cautious still. We're not sure if we're going to get a full house. If we don't get a full house, we can't really afford to fly from overseas, particularly Australia. We're a long way away from many of those um, more engaged artistic audiences across Europe and North America. But it feels as though it's starting to open up and people are more willing to step back into the theatre. And hopefully that only continues. I know that for some, the kind of, it's become a habitual mode of being to be kind of more isolated. And there's not only the physical isolation, but there's also the kind of mental isolation, the emotional isolation of that time. So I feel as though uh, maybe the arts isn't, or you know, live performance is an opportunity to be out with people, but we're not kind of necessarily needing to engage and kind of be sharing words or a conversation or a meal. It's like, great, we can sit here. I'm still kind of in my seat. I've got this small pocket of isolation and maybe that can continue to extend. You know, people can become more and more comfortable being with one another again because we are a social species and it's so important that we continue to cultivate the qualities of connection and relational engagement with other humans. It feels so imperative and maybe now more than ever, particularly on the other side of COVID, but as we approach some of the massive challenges, you know, on a global scale, we need one another and we need to be able to be together. Thanks, Carl. How wonderful like, to think about it too, you know, like it's hard, but we can only kind of move forward if we're having these conversations and that touring, that idea of touring too, you know, I spent a month in Singapore in December and it's so important, I felt so opened up and that conversation internationally that we are, you know, we live in these really regional local places but we can go out into the world and we bring back those thoughts and ideas and connections and, and that's important for our spaces too. I'm wondering if there's any questions from the audience. We've got a couple of floating mics. It's not really a question, but it might invite or trigger another couple of um, anecdotes from you. But um, 
it's a Ronnie Burkett story. I saw him in, um, in the Arts Centre Melbourne in the George, the the, the amphitheatre type, I've forgotten what it's called. The Fairfax. The, yeah, the Fairfax. And um, in 2003, oh my God, yeah. And um, it got to a point in that performance, he was the only one directing all the marionettes, where it, it was a, a story about Czechoslovakian, a Czechoslovakian puppeteer. So you had a puppeteer operating a puppeteer puppet who then had its own puppet. <laughs> and then that puppet had a bear called Howard. <laughs> and, and obviously John Howard was in power and that was absolutely deliberate of Ronnie. So we had the, the Prime Minister of Australia talking about small and the big colliding. The Prime Minister of Australia was the plushie of a puppet, of a puppet puppeteer being puppeted by who was Ronnie, and um, I mean that's the beauty, isn't it, of of um, of the arts and how you can um, how the small can just be voluminous, an ocean, an ocean of idea. Yeah. Yeah, but also like in what you're saying there, like the the marionettes are quite small; they're probably this high off the ground. So then, if the puppet is small, then the bear is even smaller. So I think it's like, you know, where does your where 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 does your eye go? Where does your eye go as, as an audience member? And if there's only one thing moving and it's very small or there's two bodies moving and, and you, you know, your eye has a... Has a, a it, it, it's limited or the, the director or the maker is, you know, you can really focus the audience's attention. Um, one thing that I've really learned, like, over the last couple of years in, in, in making puppetry and um, with no... With no um, words is the ability of sound to provide a close-up and you know the the fact that you could hear the movement of the of the dancers bodies um, last night it's amazing how when a small gesture like you know we work with the paper escape has puppets that are probably this high off the arm of the chair but when the gesture of the puppet is linked exactly to the sound you can see it very very clearly and it is like providing a microscope um, yeah, it's, it's, it's really helpful. There's some really, again, amazing research that Amber and I were quite curious uh, to explore a number of years ago around when more of the senses are engaged with an experience. It's a much deeper and more profound experience for the audience to be watching. So that thing is so real and so powerful when we're working with, you know, multiple senses and then these kind of you know, the more energetic aspects of the, the watcher, the viewer, there's something really very, very special. And that thing can sort of happen in some ways when you're watching film, it's a really powerful medium, but live performance has kind of got these other visceral experiences that are shared with an audience. It's really you know, it's super special, super powerful. That, that particular performance was three hours long, um, three hours. No one left to go to the toilet, Everyone was breathing together and no one wanted to leave the theatre. He had to stand there and say, in, or say you know, after seven minutes of clapping, go, you know, that's how. <laughs> we were co-regulating utterly. Yeah, there were moments last night, when, especially when they were hitting the ground, I was trying to work out if, if it was mic'd, the mat was mic'd. I knew some of it was not their bodies, some of it was their bodies, and it felt so, like, you know, you're watching something, you're still like, be careful, you know, like, you yeah. <laughs> got to ache for them. Like, I don't know what's the point, but it's, yeah. It's such an interesting thing, and it's only just now occurred to me hearing you say that, that we can watch kind of, you know, epic films, and I watched Avatar with Amber a couple of weeks ago, it's like, whoa, and I found that quite exhausting, but, you know, we do become desensitised to film and the intensity of these things that we're witnessing, but when it's a live human right there, the compassion and the empathy and the feeling into their experience because they're a real human, that's so powerful, so beautiful. Yeah, absolutely, and it's different. I saw that guitar too, my wife, and afterwards, just for hours, was just like... <laughs> <laughs> All the guns. Another question. Too many guns. Too many, many guns. I just wanted the water story, the beautiful, like, yeah, it was amazing. <laughs> Three hours of swimming instead. <laughs> Maybe, maybe, oh, there's a question. 
I was just about to make a compare and contrast to Avatar, but I suppose, uh, I suppose I'm just um, interested to open up this chat about emotion and how it is for you both as makers, because um, I teach in theatre and performance at UTAS and I showed the students, actually it was your trailer for Forever Young, because we were talking about how art can sort of open up for an audience and get people thinking about a particular issue, and in this case, dementia. As I was showing them, you know, as a lecturer, and of course what happened, I burst into tears <laughs> watching it, because it took me straight, even though I'd already seen it before, but it took me straight into the experience of my mother, my mother's journey with dementia in aged care. And it was watching the faces of the old people, it wasn't watching the public, <laughs> it was watching the reception. And I just wonder if either of you could reflect on what that's like to watch um, your work being received and, and the emotion around that for you. Um, I think, well, I think it's really, um, I think it's really gratifying when you feel like what you've done is making a difference to someone. I think that that's like, that's very, that's, you f I mean, it, you, you feel like you've definitely done your job if you can see that it's made a difference to someone. So that's, um, that's, that's good, yeah. Um, Amber was saying last night, and I had definitely felt the same thing, that watching the dancers in red, it's a particular situation that they're, they're in, and watching them, it feels like, as the makers, we're totally there with them, with them in that bubble, and totally here with you, with the audience, and experiencing the things that we're experiencing. So it's a deep, it's like an embodied um, experience of empathy and connection, and that's such a beautiful thing to share with people. It's really wonderful. And hearing your reflection on watching the, the trailer, it's like what a, what a wonderful thing the arts is to, for us to be able to practice emotion as well, to practice feeling, and to practice feeling, to teach feeling, and to be comfortable feeling, because that's, you know, it's a pretty important part of being a human, and we've got, Amber and I have a six-year-old or a soon-to-be six-year-old, and we're talking so much about feelings and emotions with him at the moment, so it's really beautiful hearing your response to that that is, you know, visceral and live and unavoidable, and to share that and be vulnerable with the students so that we can all maybe get a little bit better at feeling the things kind of deeply in ourselves that, um, yeah, uh, that are there, that are there, but maybe when we spend too much time up here in the kind of thinking part and not so much in the feeling part, we ignore some of that stuff. So I really appreciated hearing that you know, your response was so alive. And it is partially sometimes the way that we uh, teach through primary school and secondary school. I, I've noticed the students that we get is that teaching of like, um, you don't have to 100% understand it. Like you can feel it and that's enough. That's why contemporary dance is so good. I often don't understand it. <laughs> I watch contemporary dance shows and I'm like, I have no idea what that was about, but I felt so much. And that's, that's, that's a good place to start. Yeah, we've got another question. Um, look, this is, so foolish to perhaps take it in some ways, but, uh, and thank you both for, uh, I've not seen a lot of Terrapin's work, but I did see Heath in this market today, and that was wonderful, and I met to dance in all past night. So this is a question about that piece. And it's a practical question in one way, but I suspect it's... Kind of, well, I want to know whether it's practical or dramaturgical. And it's just about... When, they, when the dancers took their clothes off, mm -hmm. slowly, I was... Well, not slowly, but, in, you know... Um, I was curious about how much that was a practical consideration because they must have been so bloody hot in there. Yes. <laughs> yeah. And um, and how because it had a dramaturgical effect on me, yeah. especially uh, I told Davina I'd become a vegetarian after watching them in the corner in the plastic. <laughs> but so yeah, I'm just really curious about that how how that unfolded dramaturgically, I suppose. Yeah. So. 
both, both side by side. So we were really curious about this idea of kind of the most vulnerable expression of those two bodies in the structure, and that is, of course, being nude. Um, but also, nude for nude's sake is ridiculous and unnecessary. There's plenty of it in the world, and we don't need to kind of in, uh, invite that into the performance context unless it really makes sense. And it is ridiculously hot in there. And depending where we perform, so we had a season obviously in Townsville, but we had a big season in Brisbane Festival in 2021. And we were performing in a large warehouse space. It was super hot, September in Brisbane. And you, like it was completely misted inside. You couldn't see the dancers in that last kind of few minutes. It was dripping wet. So they'd take these clothes off and they were actually wiping, you know, like wiping the shower curtain or the, the window in the shower to kind of be able to give the audience a view into their experience inside. So for that reason, it makes a lot of sense and it means that we can step into that space and then, of course, your response for either kind of more dramaturgical or conceptual rationale, that entangles beautifully with the reality of their experience, which is why, why it works for us. Yeah. And one last question there. Um, just a question about the, I found the, the third performer, which was the sound in, in red, and um, in the, the Matthew Barney Eskin. Uh, just the development of the sound with Alistair and how that, how, how, how that played out, because it was, mm -hmm. it was incredibly powerful in that respect. Yeah, so, I mean, I like the way that you've kind of phrase that question about the third performer because there are a number of elements to the sound and Alistair McIndoe, who's an incredible dancer, sound maker, artist of all the things, um, he worked with Amber and I on this project but we also invited in the work or the recordings of a Swedish composer named Ellen Arkbro and Ellen works with these 17th century organs in very particular German churches and she records the entire environment. So she's really into the resonance of space, which makes sense in this context, but it's super pure. And Alastair is a kind of total tech nerd who, you know, reverbs and plays things 50,000 times faster than they normally are to create these kind of textural arcs. And then was really interested in exploring the sound of the structure, the space, and there are contact mics on the um, kind of plastic, on the bubble, and then also underneath the floor. So those three elements combined create a, a kind of a world that is immediate, completely linked to the performer's experience, as you were talking about, Sam. And I think there's something quite beautiful about the collision between this very pure, you know, like Ellen was so pure in her desire to have her music represented in the way that she wanted it represented that she wouldn't eat. There was another track that Amber fell in love with and she's like, no, you can't have that. That can only be played as it is with absolutely no interference from anyone, least of all Alastair McIndoe, who <laughs> comes out 50,000 times. Um, so it was, it was a beautiful process to work with these kind of three things and find the synergy between them all. And for us, the sound, you know, there's kind of this, this beautiful arc in the sound world. And then the final moment, um, we introduced this voice, which was Sarah Black. And Sarah Black was one of the original performers in the work. And Sarah, I think it was three weeks in, injured her knee in rehearsals and was unable to perform. So with Sarah kind of being in the space, and I don't know if she was just singing or making sound at some point, and it was so perfect to then introduce this human element, a very human element to the end of the show. So those four elements combined um, created the third performer. I have a feeling we could talk all afternoon, but I'm on um, tight time, so that's where we have to wrap it up. Thank you both so much. Thanks, Davina. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>